All right. Good morning. It's good to see a full house. Um, this is Pentecost Sunday. Hey, y'all. Hey. I wanted to ask y'all to do something a little different today, but y'all can just close your eyes for a second. So it says in Scripture for us to capture our, our imagination and, and basically submit it to Christ. So I wanted to cast a vision to y'all. It says in Proverbs 29, 18, I'm reading from the Passion Translations, when there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. And that in the King James, it says perish, people perish. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. So I wanted to cast a vision, if y'all can capture this vision and, and, and allow it to just to saturate you. It says, the Holy Spirit gave me this vision. He said, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil. You are vats filled and overflowing with fresh golden oil. You are saturated and fragrant. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for overflowing through us. Thanking, thank you, Holy Spirit, for saturating us in you. You know what's exciting? Y'all can open your eyes. One thing I was talking to God about is earlier on and where he started this church, we're four years old as of like Friday. But as we started this church, God was, was telling us to not look at numbers. And today I was like, okay, I'll bite, you know, like a fish, like I'll bite. Like, aren't numbers important at all? And God says, when you're, when you're worshiping me, my presence is the most important thing. And I think that's why a lot of y'all are here, because you've come and you've come back because the presence of God just shows up heavy and tangible. It shows up thick. It's this thick, oily presence of the Holy Spirit that saturates and coats us. And it changes us. We allow it to permeate us. Um, I think that's why this church is a successful church, not by the numbers. Although I love seeing faces, you know. It's through the presence of God showing up tangibly. And through the tangible presence of his love through us, that, that, the, that church becomes more than just a gathering of people, but it's a presence of, of, of gathering around him. All right, it's time for tithes and offerings, y'all. Thank you for your support. If you'd like to make a check, you can make out the God Manifest. You can also give online, godmanifest.com forward slash donate. 2 Corinthians 9, 10, Passion, it says, This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmers which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant towards you. First, he supplies every need plus more. Thank you, Lord, for supplying every need we need. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. I believe we have the most generous church in Houston. I'm not, a, I'm not about prosperity and, and finances, but prosperity in the spirit. And I think we are the most pros prosperous spiritual church spirit-filled church in Houston because of your hearts to give, your hearts to listen, your hearts to, to search after and chase down the presence of God where he is. And thank you all for doing that, and thank you all for sowing to what God is doing here. The miracle signs and wonders that are erupting, we had a friend, Jody Hughes, she has a, a weekly show on God TV, say, hey guys, I just want to pray for Olivia and Jonathan yesterday. It's kind of neat to sit there and have them call us out and just say, we know miracle signs and wonders are erupting with, through your all's ministry, but there are, there's a greater level coming. And I believe that. And y'all are accredited for that, and y'all will be used for that. I believe the ministry expands beyond just us and where we're at. It's where it's y'all and where y'all are at, as long as the Holy Spirit is in you and you're following the Christ. All right. Y'all noticed the last few weeks we don't have child care yet. Hopefully, Rhea comes back soon. Um, Rhea is Juanita's daughter. She's 19, and she's... She's our paid child care, so hopefully she comes back soon. Um, so we can have child care back there. But in the interim, please, parents, go back and check on your kids. And um, at the end, if parents could just take turns weekly or together, just kind of help us pick up. Because um, I was up this morning at, what is it, 6 o'clock this morning preparing. And most weeks, I'm up at 3 or 4 in a.m. on Sundays preparing. And the last thing I really want to do is to go back there and clean. But I will um, and scrub and pick up and vacuum and things. So if y'all can help with that, that would be great. June 6th, Mitko and Albina will be here. I shared a lot about them. One of the greatest theologians I know. So a lot of us, a lot of people like coming here because it, you, you get a lot of rhema words, the spoken word. I also feed you all with the written word. But this man, man, the way he takes the written word and breathes it to life 
is extraordinary. So y'all would love that. There were a few people here last week that wanted a copy of the Passion Translation. Three? All right, let's take care of that before I forget. Would you mind giving me that? All right, you are going to love it. There's a reading plan in back that's really, really cool. It's broken down by day, so you can just go like whatever day is, the 23rd, I think. You can do the 23rd and just follow those reading plans. And it's just, you'll read the entire Bible fairly quickly. And, uh, and the Passion Translation is written by our friend Brian Simmons. He's a lead translator. He went back to the oldest known version that he can, you can, um, a person can get a hold of and started there. He's also, uh, he has a doctorate in li- linguistics. So he's gone to nations where, where there were no written words, learned their language, created their, their, their written words, and translated the Bible into their language. So this is a man who knows words. He, he know, understands the Aramaic. He understands Hebrew. He understands Greek. Um, so he's going back to the Hebrew, the Greek, and even the spoken Aramaic word, and it just kind of breaks it down. So you're all going to love that book. All right. Let's get started. If you never failed, you've never tried anything new. Albert Einstein. If you never failed, you never tried anything new. Hey, luckily for you, I failed plenty of times. So that means I've tried some new things. And I was, I was willing to try these new things. And I know that all of us, if I ask if anyone has failed here before in something, we all will raise our hand. Uh, what God wanted to speak about today is the art of failure. There's, a, there's beauty in embracing what we perceive as failure, and we will allow God to. God will paint something beautiful with the failures and allow us to learn a great lesson. I believe that if you allow God to use our perceived failures, to me, failures is just a perception. Our perceived failures, he will take that and give us the greatest lessons of our life. How many of you all have failed at something and then turned around and realized how much you've learned what to do and what not to do? I have. As a pastor, I have, right? I'm like, okay, shouldn't talk to someone that way, you know? That's a true story. Like, I'm like, yeah, that tone probably wasn't the, the, the most pastoral t- tone I could, I could have started with, um, but I think that, that week, this is a true story. It was like, I worked 120 hours that week, and, I, and then I ministered to somebody, and probably I should know my limits and know my boundaries. So anyways, it's, 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 it's in those moments where when you fail and you make a mistake, it's leaning on God and saying, how did this happen? What can I learn from this? And taking what you learn and moving forward. It says in Romans 3.23 that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Y'all know that, right? Without Christ, we're not righteous. We're not saved. We're not redeemed. It's only through him that we, ha- we, are, we are called his righteousness, which is 2 Corinthians 5.21. So our righteousness, what makes us righteous, can only come through him who is righteous. I think that's a, that's, that verse will keep you, that, that mindset will keep you from straying into pride because you realize, wow, I am doing a lot of great things for the kingdom of God, but I wouldn't be able to without him empowering me. Wow, I can't believe I am washed clean, but I would not be washed clean without he who is without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, dying for my sins and his blood that was shed for me. I think humility will open up the kingdom of God for you in, in ways. Like when you're reading scripture, like Olivia and I are going through the reading plan in that Passion Translation together. Well, obviously I'm a pastor. I read the Bible. Olivia grew up in church. She's read the Bible but being able to go through and just keep searching and searching and searching. And the more you search, the more gold you're going to find. I had a sermon like a year and a half ago. I called it, I said, Christians are gold diggers. We go and dig the gold that God has hidden in his word out. And we find the golden people and call it out. You know, we're not gold diggers in the sense of the word. A lot of people are afraid of prosperity gospel. I'm saying, hey, we're going to prosper if, we, if our prophetic gift is used to, to, to locate and call out the golden people. So I don't mind being a gold-digging Christian, right? Because I find the gold in you, and I will call it out, even if it gains me nothing. And as Christians, I think we're called to do that. Luke 14, verses 27 to 32. I'm reading from the Passion. Anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross, this is Jesus speaking, and experience it as his own. He cannot be considered to be a disciple 
or he cannot be considered to be a disciple. Experiencing his cross and carrying it as your own, and then you're a disciple. He goes on, he says, don't follow me without considering what it, it will cost you. For who would construct a house before setting down to estimate, sitting down to estimate the cost of the com- to complete it? Otherwise, he may lay a foundation and, and not be able to finish. The neighbors would ridicule him, saying, look at him. He started to build but could not complete it. Well, in failure, a lot of times we're counting the cost before it happens. You ever y'all done that? You talk yourself out of something, and then when you finally go pursue it, you realize, I didn't fail. And God is looking at you and goes, I called you to this, fill in the blank, whatever he's calling you to, or to this person, or to this platform to get a chance to share. He's not going to fail as long as you're following him. You're not going to fail. His goal isn't for you to fail. But his goal is if you fail, he's there to lift you up, teach you an amazing lesson, dust you off. And when you say, Lord, I'm sorry for going astray, he says, you're forgiven. I've forgotten what you just did now. Like literally, like you could do something right now, turn around and say, Lord, I am so sorry. And he says, I forgive you. And you say it again. I'm so sorry. He goes, for what? He says, he forgets your transgressions no more. That means it's washed away. I'm not a parent, but I am a pastor. And I know parents, parents love that way a lot of times. Like, and it's hard. There are a lot of parents here, right? When your kids act up and, they, and, you, and you want to spank them, right? You, you're not going to spare the rod. You want to spank them, right, Juanita? <laughs> so uh, so when, you're, when your kids act up and they act this way, and then they come back and they repent, we as humans, we still remember the transgressions. God is saying, it's wiped from my memory. Not only that, even greater, it's wiped from your history. We had a friend that was, we had two different friends. A friend of mine, he, he has a big ministry now. I'm not going to say his name, but he's, he travels all over the U.S. He's a prophetic voice. You know, y'all can find him on Sid Roth. He was on Sid Roth once or twice. But he was talking about how he was a pimp and a murderer in jail for murder. He's supposed to spend life in there. And all of a sudden, the courts decided to release him. And now the courts can't find a record of what he did in the court system. And I have another friend who is a gangbanger. He has, y'all, you know, I grew up on the streets, so he has some tears, teardrops on his face. And last time he was here, he spoke here one time, and then one of the members goes, what are the teardrops? He goes, dude, you know what the teardrops are. I don't want to talk about it. It's not part of my history anymore. Well, here he is applying for jobs after leaving for at least after leaving prison for one of those teardrops. One of, I think he has three, right? And then he's applying for a job. He puts on your, he, you, you, have you all applied for a job before? He says, do you have a, any, a criminal record? Yes, misdemeanor, yes. Like, what, what did you do? Murdered a man, right? And they, and they say, hey, we, we ran your record. It's wiped from your history. You don't, are you sure? Did you mistaken? Are you sure you went to jail for murder? That is ridiculous. That's, those are physical manifestations of the goodness of God. That's a physical manifestation. It doesn't happen to all of us, right? But it happens to all of us in the spiritual. Some of us, I have friends that have gone to prison. Some of them are still there. But they're in there now serving God. I have a friend right now. He was in El Paso. He just got transferred. He's in there. He grabbed a hold of my book. Read it all, passed it to his cellmate. His cellmate read it. He passed it to the next cellmate. The stat cellmate read it. And next thing you know, it, it spread like wildfire. And I got six letters of salvations. And this is a man who went to prison for, for guns and drugs. But what did he do with that failure? He capitalized on it for Christ. And he, I believe he's a changed man. I gave the prophetic word to our friend who's, a, who's the mother hey, your son is going to come out and the Holy Spirit is going to blow on him and through him. And the moment he steps out of prison this next time, I think it's, his, it's been his third time, he's going to transform before your eyes as he walks towards you. Man, I see gold in him. And I'm calling that gold out. And when we talk to him, we tell him about his gold, not his transgressions. Because we see, we're supposed to see the way that Christ sees. 
The hardest people to see that way is family, right? But we can look at our, we're not going to name names in here because some family members watch, but we can look at somebody's family and say, hey, we see the struggle you're going through, right, with this person. But what you don't see is four years from now, this is going to happen. What you don't see is this person is actually going to travel to a different country and minister. What you don't see is this person is going to ask you for forgiveness out of the blue. What you don't see is your heart's going to heal, right? And as prophetic voices, and pro- we say, I see prophetically, right? Say it. I see prophetically. Y'all see, hear, and speak prophetically. And as you begin to go out and you begin to do those things Christ has told you to do and pursue the people that Christ has told you to pursue, and you, and you begin to speak to who Christ has called them to be, you're going to watch them transform to gold. So in 2017, like I told you, this is our fourth year anniversary. So at 2017, we heard, I heard an audible voice during worship at our, our, our friend's church. We were members of that church. God said, start in May. This is January like 1st or, or 2nd. The first, this is our Sunday of 2017. Here we are sitting there in church during worship, and that's when God talks to me. Why? Because my heart is being recalibrated during worship to worship him, and suddenly I could hear and feel him louder and feel him better. So anyways, God said, start in May, and I knew exactly what he was talking about. He wanted to start church, May 2017. I turned and looked at Olivia, and I sat down. I crossed my arms. I was like, no way. I am not interested. So what happened a few months ago, right? A few months before that, the end of 2016, the end of 2016, a woman named LaVon shows up, a prophet. We're, Olivia and I are just sitting there at our friend's church hanging out, and she releases a prophetic word. I see the two of y'all opening up your living room and gathering people around God. I see your neighbor getting saved. And I'm like, I look behind me, I'm like, you talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> I am not opening up my living room to have a bunch of strangers show up. You're talking to the wrong people. And she just kept on going and going and going about this grand vision, which is like today. I'm looking out and going, this is what she prophesied, and this is what I initially did not think I wanted. But seeing the fruit from y'all makes it all worth it. So I'm looking at God, start in May, and I said, no way, no thank you, not going to happen. You've got the wrong couple, God. I was saved, I was Buddhist, and I was saved in 2003. I visited one or two home churches at that time. I thought home churches were weird. God has a funny sense of humor. Um, here I am sitting in the living room, my living room, having a home church, right? But when, and then I was like, and I told Olivia, and she said, what do you say to God? I'm like, no. She said, all right, I trust your leadership. And I was like, oh, my gosh. When a wife says that to a husband, we're like, <laughs> okay, am I following God's lead right? Because she's trusting my leadership. What's wrong with her? Is she crazy? <laughs> I'm like, you can't trust my leadership. I'm human, right? And then next week, boom, same thing. I'm during worship, deeper into worship. God says, start in May. And I sat down. I'm like a little boy. No, you need to stop this. This is madness. I am not interested. And he, he just continued to talk about other things during this time. And I'm like, not interested. I don't know how many times I tell you, week after week after week after week. I think it was the beginning of March. God said, start in May. And I said, you realize we're in leadership at this church, and this church, the, we don't want, it was, it was a small church. It was like eight people, nine people. If we step, if we leave, they lose a big piece of their church, right? And I can, rec- I can, I can, I can imagine that because our church was once four or five like, dedicated members. So one person left, that, that was a big loss. So I was like, we can't do that to us. Them God. And Olivia and I was about to go to vacation, right? So we're planning the vacation. We tell them, hey, we're, we're taking vacation. We, we're going to miss next Sunday. This is in March 2017. And he goes, Pastor, his name is Ray and Sue. I think they've spoken here a few times. Ray goes, ah, we need to talk to y'all in person. And I was like, are we getting kicked out? 
we're tithers. We've never missed a meeting. This is our first Sunday we're missing in like a year and a half. Like we've, we've been here every Saturday, every Sunday, you know, every Wednesday. We're like, what is he? He looks serious. So Olivia and I show up on Wednesday. He goes, come early when they talk to you. And we're sitting in front of him. He says, God told us to close our church. And I, I literally just covered my face and I said, you mean go back to your house, right? This is the church we're talking about that God told him to start a church. He, they rented a place and all out of a Westheimer, prime real estate. That's why someone just says, hey, y'all need a church. And I'm like, I don't know if I want that, that burden on me unless God tells me. But anyways, here he, here he is. And I said, when? He goes, the last week of April. And Olivia looked at me, and I looked at Olivia, and I, and I discovered my I wanted to cry in front of these two. And, I, and they said, oh. and Sue is very prophetic. Did God tell you to do something? And I was like, no. And she goes, are you starting our church? And I was like, <laughs> and I looked at Olivia, and I'm like, what is wrong with these prophetic people in this church? Everyone wants us to start something. And I was like, I guess so. I guess so. And I said, y'all were my excuse. And she's laughing because she became a a turner minister. She's traveling all over from Michigan down, down to Houston, down to Corpus, all over. And I was like, are you kidding me? And she said, when? I said, God told us to start in May. And then she goes, that must be confirmation because we're ending. I said, I get it. You're ending on the, the day before May starts. I get it. I just got to get over myself. Now, the one reason why I wasn't interested in, in starting a church was spiritual gifts like prophecy and healing will have the ability to draw, bring out the crazy people and the crazy out of people. Y'all been there? You go to church and you're like, everyone was like, I lean on every word that comes out of his mouth. And you're like, I've had that people. People, I have that. I've had have text messages that I can show you where people said, I live by every word that comes out of, that God speaks through Jonathan's mouth. And I was like, wow, I don't speak that many words to you. So you must be lost like half the year. Right. And I was like, no, thank you. I think I responded one day. No, thank you. You have to live by every word that comes out of the Father's mouth, like Jesus demonstrated and, and showed. But I'm telling you, like spiritual gifts, like I was like, no. And I grew up Buddhist, picked to be a Buddha, not a Buddhist monk, a Buddha at 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old. I've tasted and seen the, the applause and worship of man, and it was bitter. I was like 8 or 9-year-old. And these monks came from Tibet, probably the, the most famous monk in the world, showed up at the temple I was at and picked me. And I looked at my mom and I went, no, I am not going to Tibet. I don't speak their language. I want to get married because I think women are pretty. I was like a little kid and I, I was like, and I like meat. That's all issues, <laughs> right? I really said that to her. And I'm like, I, I like steaks. I like pork chops. They don't eat meat. They don't believe in marriage. There's an issue here. Girls are very pretty. I don't know if I can give up meat and women. Like, I was a little kid. Like, I'm like, can't do it. And my mom goes, they say, well, you have to 10 years old to let us know. I was like, it's going to be no. But then my mom started parading me around temple to temple, the chosen child. And these people started acting weird. So it left a bitter taste in my mouth. There are some people I've met that said, man, I would have milked that. I would have gotten a car. I would have gotten steaks, you know, whatever it was, right? Like me, it was food. I like food. Like you give me food, I'm happy. And so, but not me. I was like, that is not a taste I like. The worship of man is odd. So spiritual gifts naturally will draw out the worship of man. And it's a man's job. I mean, man as in like man and woman. It's our job as leaders to say, man, it's all God, but you're welcome, Right? Because you took a part in it and say, hey, no, no problem. I'm glad the prophetic word came to life. We had Dennis and Pam come to me just this morning and say, the prophetic word he ran in the release was confirmed that evening, I think, and then one or two other times after that. And I was like, that's good. Because to me, it was a huge prophetic word. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I hope I'm delivering it right. And another reason why I wanted, wanted, we didn't want to do it was we had a lot of friends who were pastors and ministers around the world at that point. We saw the abuse that they took. <clears throat> we saw the dishonor, the rejection, the pain that he felt. We saw the unspoken and unhealthy expectations of man 
weigh on them. We saw the amount of personal time that they gave up. Like, to us, we, we don't pressure you to come. So you can take a Sunday off. We're not going to freak out. But we take a Sunday off, you know, like people will look at us like we're crazy because they're pastors. And those price at that time, the prices that we were supposed to pay, we counted it. I counted it. I think she was okay with it initially. But I was like, I don't know if I can pay that price. The greatest way to make a man fall is to exalt him, right? And that, that was a fear of mine. However, after the prophetic word, after the prophetic confirm, confirmation, we finally said yes. It took a lot, of, a lot of talks from God and a lot of prophetic words before we were like, fine. You know what God said next? If you build it, you sustain it. If I build it, I'll sustain it. And I went, I have a lot of friends in Houston. You mean I can't invite anybody? We're just going to start. Awesome. Like, and not tell people. And over the years, we watched people just randomly show up. Some were invited from ch- uh, churches on, online were telling them about us, and some from word of mouth, some of other groups of the Bible studies. And I'm watching this God build this place, and I'm like thinking to myself, I had this fear of failure. My success was measured by numbers. And when some days it was one person sitting here, it was Olivia, and that's one person. And, and, and a friend of mine watched one day, and I was just preaching my heart out. And he gave me a text message, man, you must have had a huge group that day. And I said it was one person, <laughs> right? It was my friend Ray, the guy who ordained us, the guy who, who sh- God shut down his church. I was like, did you really shut down this man's church? Give his church back, God. Well, we'll do it. Don't shut his church down, right? And he, and he said, where'd you learn that? And I said, from you. Because he had a church of eight or nine. And some days it was just the two of us. And he preached his heart out. And I said, I learned from watching you. It's amazing how unspoken fear, the, the expectation of failure will prevent us from walking into God's calling. Right? So now four short years later, I can say that I'm a little biased. We have the most amazing flock of church members I've ever seen. Y'all are empowered. Y'all hear God. We practice hearing and speaking God's prophetic words regularly. Y'all are out living your life and, and doing your ministry that God told you to call you to do and gathering here and ministering to one another. That is a healthy church. Y'all have a voice. Like we watched y'all last week. First, it was the first day, right, last week. Just jump in and minister to people. We walked over, we were like, we are impressed. These people are coming here and they're hungry and they're just pouring out their hearts to strangers because in the, in the, in the body of Christ, there are no strangers. We just watch the love pour out. It's amazing. We've learned to protect our, our flock from goats and wolves and how to see them. We learned to set boundaries for herself. Some people have unrealistic expectations of you. We learn to set boundaries because a lot of the other pastors would like, or some of our more mature pastors who've been ministering for a long time and said, set boundaries because you don't, the, those, those who, are, who, who are being sent by the enemy will drain you. So we're learning to set boundaries. It's pretty interesting just, and y'all watched us through our growing pains and we're still growing and it's still painful. And we've helped some of y'all through y'all's growing pains. It's amazing. It's just these, these four years have been, has been instrumental to our growth. I'm glad y'all are growing too. But I'm like, man, I can't believe I knew so little. And as, I, as we grow in Christ, we realize how little we actually know of him. And I tell people, like, these miracles are happening. These things are happening. And, I, and I've just smudged the surface. I haven't had a chance to scratch it yet. So it's exciting to see what's going to happen next when, when we begin to, to open up the treasure chest out is Christ. And you know what? We figured out that y'all are worth it. Y'all are worth me waking up at 3 a.m. on Sundays. You know, sometimes we're ministering and traveling. We were traveling Friday and Saturday. We came home, and I, that's why I woke up so early today, to make sure what I was feeding was, was, was food that would feed me and also feed you. Y'all have grown in faith, boldness, fiery power, just the, the, 
Because God says, you're supposed to move in dunamis power, and I'm watching y'all move in dunamis power from day one. Some of y'all are, came as more mature Christians. Some of y'all came as newer Christians. But instantly, there's no competition. I think that's one thing that God looks at in a, in a family of believers. Are they competing and vying for position, or do they all know you're his favorite? I remember my brother and I used to sit against my mom. I knew my brother was my mom's favorite, so I knew she was going to lie to me. But she goes, Mom, who's your favorite? He goes, both of you, she said. And I was like, whatever. David's her favorite. I knew it. And I asked her. She goes, both of you. Both of you. And I'm like, that's impossible. Favorite is, is, a, is, a, is a singular noun, you know? But it's, it's true. Had a guy come up to me. We ministered. Uh, Juanita and Jessica was with us in Victoria, and then he came up to me, and he goes, I don't want to sound boastful, but I'm God's favorite. And I was like, you're not boastful, because you, I, I'm God's favorite. And he kind of looked at me, and I looked at his wife, and I said, now you are actually God's favorite. I said, between the two of y'all, we favor you. And I said, and he goes, well, that's fine. I have other friends, <laughs> you know. But it was funny, because it's, it's all true. And if we, if we approach the throne as sons and daughters, in sonship, knowing we're his favorite, he'll, he's going to lavish everything he has on us. One of the greatest lessons I had with Christ is he said, when you're in a kingdom, the greatest treasure is not, is, is not in, the, in, in the treasure chest. It's on the throne. When you have access to he who is on the throne, you have access to the kingdom. If you chase the treasure, you only have the treasures. Like gifts, right? Some people only chase the gifts of Christ, but not Christ. We're called to chase after the king and follow the king. That's what it says in scripture. If you are my disciples, you will follow me. And then miracles, signs, and wonders will follow you. So I grew up a huge sports fan. To me, you know, I grew up in the 90s. I was, in, I was middle school and high school in the 90s. Um, with some of y'all weren't even born. I'm not going to name names. Okay. But uh, it, it's crazy, right? When you talk to, talk to someone who's like 19, when were you born? And they'll say like 2002. I'm like, no, seriously. Like 2001. Like, two, what? How is that possible? You look like a grown up. You know, but anyways. So to me, the greatest athlete and competitor ever in sports is Michael Jordan. I'm a Hakeem Olajuwon fan, I'm a Rockets fan, but man, there ain't no one like Jordan. I'm not saying, I'm not using him as an example because he's a Christian. I don't know what he believes in. He's pretty private in what he, what he shares. But I just, I just appreciate his work ethic and his accomplishment, his mentality, and his, 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 his ability to not focus and look at failure. He's won six championships, five MVP awards, six NBA finals awards, 10 scoring titles, which is a record. I just go on and on and on. He has record upon record. And he, he, if, if you look at the record people that he's beaten or he's around, he played less games than most of them. He scored the, he's, he's averages the most points in NBA history for a season, most points in the playoffs. Like, he was a man. I watched, Olivia and I watched, like, she's not a big sports fan. We watched, what was it? Michael, the Michael Jordan documentary? The last, the last Dance. Yeah, we watched The Last Dance, and I was like, how intriguing. How intriguing. Like, you challenge this man, he goes, figures out how to beat you, and he beats you. In any, almost anything. So it's pretty amazing. So he said this in an interview, I think in the 90s. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost o- almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over in my life, and that is why I succeed. The key to success is failure. I know God is an obstacle. No, God, I know fear is an obstacle for some, but it is an illusion for me. Heart is what separates good from great. My favorite quote from that is, I know fear is an obstacle for some, but it's an illusion to me. Why? Because fear is a liar. We hear that as a Christian all the time, but do we believe fear is a liar? 
How many of us has fear has, has been worried about something, stepped into it, and just succeeded, and looked back and said, I had nothing to be worried about. 90% of the things we worry about, if not greater than that, never comes to pass. Last night, hope y'all may be freaked out, we lay down in bed, three gunshots right in front of our house, literally three houses down. But it sounded like it was right here. My brother owned a gun, a, a gun shop, so I was like, I sat up and I went, those are gunshots. I grew up in the hood. I grew up in Third Ward and, and, and a -Leaf. So I was like, I, I was about to go get it. She goes, lay back down, like where the brick is. And I'm like, I need to go get my gun just in case someone's going to kick down the door because I'm going to defend my wife and my home and my three little puppies. I have three dogs. <laughs> so I, I put a message out next door. There was a robbery one block away. There was an auto zone over there, and the car was being chased this way, and there's they shot three shots towards our house. But that didn't change. We slept in the room. That, 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 that initial shock didn't put fear in us to lose our peace. Olivia said, hey, would you pray over our sleep? Pray that we're safe? Yes. And she was like, all right, where's my gun just in case? And I was like, right here. She's like, <laughs> we're set. We're set. She's a better shot than I am. So if anything happens, she's got my back. And I'll take credit for, for, for every shot she makes. You know? She's a great shot. Fear is an absolute lie. It's an optical illusion from the enemy to paralyze us. Fear has kept many believers from experience, experiencing the kindness of God. I remember when Isaac got his back healed. He was like, I thought I had faith until I got healed. And I realized I didn't have faith, but now I have faith. Faith is, is, a, is a living, breathing thing in us, which if we begin to build it up like a muscle, it's, it grows. So he's basically, what he was really saying was, I thought I had faith until it got strengthened. And now I've got stronger faith. But you know what? If you continue to do the things God has called you to do, that faith doesn't continue to grow until you have fearless faith. There's a woman named Heidi Baker who said she's been, she's been stoned. She's been trying to ran, try, people try to run her over. She was, one day, she's like literally five foot nothing. I guess I don't know where five foot is. But she's, she was surrounded by eight men with machetes and ARs, assault rifles. And she looked at him in the face and broke down laughing. And she said, the men stopped and looked at her and said, what are you laughing at? This is in Mozambique, Africa. And she says, I'm five foot nothing white girl from California. And it takes eight, eight of y'all with, with, with rifles to kill me. Like, her thought was, the devil must be afraid. Right? There was another time she was being chased. Like, she, she, she has 3,500 orphans that call her mama now in Mozambique. She's being chased in a Jeep. They're driving. There's nowhere to go. There was, a, there was two trees that were too tight for the Jeep to go through. The person driving, she said, keep driving. And she was like, shaka baba. She starts praying in tongues, and she drove right through the middle, and the other car chased him, hit the trees, which was exactly the same vehicle. Like, she was like, our, our car either shrank or we became, we became invisible and drove through it. But she goes, she looked back. Those cars got, the car crashed into those same trees. Both sides were crushed. She drove through the kids that she just picked up off the street for saved. And she talked about faith. Olivia was reading me. When we travel a lot, she will listen to sermons, will worship, or Olivia will have a book, and, I'll, and she'll just, I'll have her read it to me. She's my auto, audio book. So she's reading this book about Honey Baker. And, and she talks about, I'm, I, I don't have fear anymore because I know God is with me. Right? I'm just paraphrasing, but God is, when you realize how much he loves you, and you know he's ordered your steps into a situation, you walk in there bold because ain't nothing going to touch you. I used to minister in Third Ward, right? I used to walk around, and uh, a lot of my friends were the drug dealers on the corners, the, the prostitutes on the street because we had a convenience store there. So one day I'm walking, my buddy D, he was a drug dealer in that corner in my store, and he goes, Jay. I figured he wanted to call me Jay because he goes by D. So I was like, uh-huh, my name is Jonathan. Like, you know, he was like, what are you doing, man? You're going to get shot and robbed. And I looked at him, I went, yeah, if you're standing next to me while I'm walking around, because, because, because your buddy who, who's, who, who owns that other corner is going to shoot you. Would you please leave me alone? 
He goes, like, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm trying to find these two people that God gave me a vision of, and I want to go bless them. Like, he goes, well, I'm going to stand in my corner and watch. If something happens, I'm going to take them out. And I was like, deal. But nothing's going to happen. Right? So what God taught me was when you're on a mission and God sends you on a mission, you go with who God tells you to go with. And you, and you tell the people who God isn't telling you to go with to stay home. Because I was like, I knew I was going to get shot. There was a rapper there named Hawk that was a customer of our store. He got shot and killed just the night before, just murdered. And he lived one block from my store, like right behind my store. So I knew there was a clear and present danger. But at that time, I also knew God had his heart for these two people that were living on the street. One was a, one was a drug, uh, a guy that was addicted to drugs. One was a prostitute. She was 68 years old. She probably looked 90 because she's been on the street since she was 21, which is a miracle already. Most people who we live on the streets don't live that long. But I knew God called me to walk those streets. Any night I'm leaving, I'm getting in my, had a sports car convertible, right? I get in my sports car convertible and God goes, get out. I'm like, I'm trying to get home to watch CSI. You know, I was addicted to CSI, the original one. Eat a frozen pizza and go to bed. And I'm like, I have things to do. I have an agenda. But, and then I pause and I always close my little convertible top and I go, but yours is more important. Who are you going for tonight and where can I find these people? It was interesting. I, I, by that point, y'all know Third Ward? Primarily a black neighborhood. There's a, there's, a, there's a man there that converted his house into a chapel and I was like 24 years old at that point. Converted his house to a chapel. So one day he just walks over to my store and said, hey, can, I, can you come to this address afterwards? I got something, I got an opportunity to present you. I'm like, I don't know you. And God says, yes. And I was like, yes, I'll be there. And I was like, at midnight, I'm like, this is great. And I'm like, who is that, God? And God goes, yes. And I was like, we clear that. I know, you said yes. Like, who is that? And he just said, yes. And I was like, guess I'm going to go and become a martyr, right? I, there's many a time that God, I thought I was going to be a martyr. I'm like, I'm going to go to this strange man's house who, who never met me before, heard about me on the streets, hands me his, his address, and I didn't even know his name. So I get in there, knock on the door. He comes down. He goes, I walk in. It was a chapel, this old house, the whole downstairs was chapel. They had drums donated, guitars donated. And he goes, this is a church. And I went, okay. And he goes, we don't have a pastor. And I went, well, I can ask around. He goes, are you, are you not the Christian who ministers on the streets? And, and how these, these prostitutes have gotten off the streets, these drug dealers, have, these, drug, these druggies have gotten cured, like delivered of, of drugs? And I said, yeah, like four of them only. And he goes, do you not have a heart for our neighborhood? I said, I do have a heart for your neighborhood, but I am not a pastor, nor will I ever be a pastor. And I said, and I said I'm Asian. And he goes, right now we just worship because we don't have anyone to preach. And I went, but I'm Asian. I'm 24 years old. And I said, everyone I minister to are like twice my age. They're not going to listen to an Asian man in third ward. And he goes, they're listening now, son. And I was like, I'm sorry, sir. And I left. Who would have known? I don't know what I'll be doing now. I'll probably be still in that house. And those men, those men and women still be, being, still be set, being set free. That whole neighborhood is changing now. It's one of the most thought sought after neighborhoods. Isaiah 61, verses 2 to 3. I'm reading from New King James Version. Pretty long. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. This is you speaking to you now, right? I'm just saying this is, when you read stuff like this, this is me speaking to you of what you're called to do, not what I'm called to do. I know my calling now. But tell you what, I know y'all's too. The Spirit of God is upon you because the Lord has anointed you to preach the tidings to the poor. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of the Lord, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil for joy, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, 
that he may be glorified. Beauty for ashes. Y'all, y'all heard about the man who got out of the wheelchair, stuck there for six years. He got healed in spite of my unbelief, in spite of my fear. I walked in. I, I just hung out with, we were in Victoria just this Friday and Saturday. We hung out, hung out with a guy who tapped me on the shoulder, who pointed at him as he stood up and started walking for the first time. And you know what? I was sitting there and I said, I thought he was going to die. Here's this man screaming. He couldn't move his legs. His upper body is moving. Ex-army, Vietnam, he's army. I guess there's no ex-army, right? Once army, always army. Vietnam vet. My family's from Vietnam. The only Vietnam vet there. The only man in a wheelchair the day before. I didn't hear from God to lay hands on him. He was screaming because he had a, he had a baseball-sized mass in his belly. He was a, uh, it was a hernia. It was a, called strangulating hernia, which apparently, I don't know anything about hernias. Hope I never experience it. And I will never experience it in Jesus' name. But apparently it's painful. And he was screaming and screaming and passing out. Waking up screaming and screaming and passing out. And I'm looking at him going, y'all have got the wrong person. Call the freaking ambulance. Because they, when they grabbed me, they said, we need your expertise. And I was like, man, I'm seeing cancer healed and stuff, but I, I am not used to seeing a man in a wheelchair screaming in pain and passing out on me. This is beyond my faith. Well, God healed his hernia. He's still healed to this day. And then on top of healing his hernia, God healed his legs. In the midst of me thinking he was going to die on my watch. Other miracles. Her grandma, stage four incurable lung cancer. God prophesied out of me when it was on a Saturday. On Tuesday, when you're cancer-free, your doctors, when your doctors tell you you're cancer-free, text me. She said, whatever, yeah, boy, I'll text you. And Olivia gets in the car and said, is that true? And I went, what's true? She said, you just told her to text you on Tuesday when she's cancer-free. And her grandma goes, how did you know I had a doctor's appointment? And I was like, I sure hope so. If not, I'm going to lose my girlfriend. Because she was my girlfriend then. And I was like, God, you're setting me up for failure. Tuesday comes, Olivia calls me over and over and over. I'm working at an oil gas company as a marketing person. I pick up and I'm like, what? And she goes, has, has Miss Jane, my grandma, called you or texted you? I'm like, no, why would she? And she goes, it's Tuesday. The doctors can't find any cancer in her lungs. That was in spite of me, right? Have you all done that before? Where you're like, you're praying for someone. Oh, God, I don't want to step out for this person. You pray for them. They go, I feel better. I'm always in shock. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, how much better? Like, you're completely better? How's that possible? They say, you told me I was going to get healed and you lay hands on me. Yeah, in faith. I didn't expect you to get healed. I had faith to say it. That was as far as my faith extends sometimes. I have enough faith to say, yes, you will get healed. And, and go, and internally, I'm like, gosh, I hope I'm right. And, and it's, these miracles happen in spite of me. In spite of my unbelief, in spite of my fear. And he'll do the same for you. And what happens now if you walk in there bold? If he's answering your, 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 your unbelief, what happens if you, if you begin to walk in there bold and expecting? Some of my greatest triumphs would not have happened without my greatest tragedies. Born dyslexic, wrote my book, 168 pages in six days. Not only like dyslexic, like severely dyslexic. In the, in the 80s and 90s, they still use the word retarded. They sat with my mom and said, your son is retarded. With me sitting in a room. And I started crying. My mom goes, what's that mean? And I explained to her in Chinese. And she goes, no, he's smart. And she grabbed me and pulled me out of that room. And I'm sitting in the car. Mama goes, what do you want to eat? And that was, was good for me. And I'm like, I want to eat some Vietnamese soup. And she goes, okay. You're not retarded. You're just not very good in school. And I was like, but the expert said I'm retarded. We have teachers here, you know. But it was interesting at that time, that word was labeled so quickly. Now they have ADHD, ADD. And they have a slew of like psychological titles they want to slap on children. And I'm telling you, with Christ, all things are possible. I remember I was asking God one time. Y'all, a lot of you all read my book. Chapter 4 is like 
It was all their abuse I've went through, like the worst abuse I've gone through. And I asked God, I said, what would happen? And I just met Olivia. And I was like, what would happen? Because I knew a lot of my emotional issues towards her and towards other people was because of my childhood. I said, what would happen if my mom never beat me to death at 12, never killed me? And God said, you wouldn't have met Olivia. And I went, okay, okay. What would happen if my mom didn't punch me in the head and made me learn math for hours and hours and hours until I memorized multiplication table? She, it, God knew I was like, I'm still in love with Olivia, but God knew at that point I was like, Olivia is my everything. And God says, you wouldn't have met Olivia. And I went down this list. And after like 10 things, I sat there and I'm like, so my life was worth it. That cost, if I, had to, if I, if I could erase one of those things, and that would mean not having her, I would go back and take it 10 times, right? My relationship with God wouldn't have happened had I not gone through those things because I wouldn't have experienced the goodness of God. There are some people that are born with what people we perceived as everything. Perfect family, the Brady Bunch, right? I know An says that. Like his, yeah, he was like, my family is a Brady Bunch. He was like, everything was perfect. I have nothing to complain about. Never was hit, never did bad. My family is perfect. And I was like, good for you. Like, where, are you going to go boil some crawfish? You know, like, we have a crawfish boy. He was like, my family, we're eating crawfish. He's like, my family's a Brady Bunch. And I was like, give me the next round of crawfish. I don't want to hear about that because it's not fair, right? But there are people that are born like that. And then those who are saved from much and healed from much, I've watched these people run after God more fervently. The people ask me, I was saying from Buddhism, right, from suicide, Literally all these things from, from a family was into, gosh, my family was into brothels, gambling. My dad was one of the biggest bookies in Houston. Like, and my brother and I used to collect money for them. A collector does things that you're not supposed to be doing, right? You just had to get the money and the things that we witnessed growing up. But you know what? When I sit and I talk to someone who's addicted to, to anything from drugs to alcohol to gambling, I know what they're going through because I've looked into their eyes hundreds of times. And now I want their freedom, not for them to pay my, my dad what, what we perceived he owed. Right? And I think it's the same thing. When I sit and I talk to a child who's from a broken home, who has brokenness, I can relate. Like we minister to, to girls and boys of all ages some of them are girls and boys that are in their 50s. They never experienced the love of a father or a mother. And when we're able to pour that out, there's no greater ex experience to watch them realize, I'm adopted from God, and I experienced God's love through you. I never knew that love existed. Is there more? And it's an ending waterfall of love. Like the saturation of the oil of God is ending, never ending, right? There's a never ending saturation of God for us. It says in scripture to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is continually pouring out. How do you get continually filled? You go, where is he pouring today? I'm going to position myself there. Okay, he's moving to this direction. I'm going to continually pour it in so I can be continually poured out of. And then miracle signs and wonders will follow. God says, you're my disciples if you follow me. And I know that y'all are disciples of Christ. You know, the first time I ever gave my testimony, y'all know my testimony, so I won't go into it. But first time I ever gave my testimony, the largest church in America is here in Houston. So my friend is a pastor, was a pastor of their young adults a thousand members, young adults, a thousand members. Like that's larger than 80% of the churches in, in, in Houston. Like, this is a young adult service. And he comes to me one day and he says, hey man, can I take you to lunch? And I said, well, you, you had me at lunch. Yes. Yeah. Right. So we're eating some, some cheap Chinese food. And um, then he says, I heard about your testimony. And I was like, who told you? He said, you used to be Buddhist. I'm like, who told you my testimony? And he goes, are you okay? And I said, I wasted 23 years of my life as a Buddhist. Who told you about my testimony? And he goes, why don't you tell me your whole story? And I went, 
why do you want to know? The, the level of deception I was in before God, God revealed himself. And he says, I actually want to know how he revealed himself. And I started sharing with him. And I'm here, sitting here in shame because 23 years, I thought, of a wasted time. And I'm pouring out my testimony. I started off with, my mom killed me at 12. I was about to commit suicide. God spoke to these women, knocked on my door. I answered. Six, six months later, eight of them got saved. And I was saved. Six months after that, I was on the streets ministering to people. Because I had time to make up for, I thought. God has an amazing way of making up decades and decades of time that we perceived we failed in. I thought I had 23 years of failure. But what God said to me was, God said, I kept you in Buddhist for 23 years so you wouldn't be affected by the religion in my church. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I joined a church, and I went, oh, get it, yeah, yeah, like... What do you mean we're not supposed to be praying for the sick? What do you mean that was for yesterday? What do you mean those are only for the apostles of that time? Like all these people were telling me all these theology stuff that they made up because of their lack of belief, the lack of experience, the lack of presence. They went, that is not for today. The Holy Spirit and praying in tongues, no. The presence of God doesn't manifest physically. Now all these people were telling me these things, and here I am, a brand new Christian, a year into it, I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. I, I understand the religion. And I was like, what is religion? God says, it's, it's man's attempt to create an atmosphere to duplicate what I have, right? Like, that's a religion. You're trying to, man, we're creating this atmosphere and saying, if you do all these rules and laws, I will show up. And, God, and, and the truth is, God says, yeah, you can do all that stuff, but I was already here. If you do all these things, God will heal you. And God is saying, I was already willing to heal you in spite of those things you want to do. So it's so interesting where, where law tells you what you can't do and relationship tells you what you can. So here I'm talking to him, Chinese, eating bad Chinese food, and, he's, and I finished my testimony and I covered my face. And he goes, he was quiet. And I looked at him, I was like, I know it was it's terrible, right, that I was, and he goes, you want to share that at, a, at my service next week? In front of a thousand people. Never shared my testimony before until him and then my, old, my best friend, right, my, 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 uh, my business partner. And I went, what? <laughs> and I'm going to get the response that you had of just staring at me? And, and I was like, why? And he goes, <coughs> your testimony has to be told. So I said yes, because God said yes. I felt God say yes, and I went yes. And He goes, "All right, I'll let you know next Sunday." I mean, it was a, what was it? That was Thursday nights. I let you know it was Friday night. He, Friday we had lunch. Next Thursday, so Wednesday comes around. He then he sends me a text message. Can I buy you lunch? The answer is always yes. And I was like, "Yeah, you can buy me lunch." He goes, "Are you ready?" And I'm like, "I guess so." And I get up on stage, right? He says, hey, do you have a giant Buddha? Well, my whole family is Buddha, Buddhist. So I was like, I can get you a giant Buddha. He goes, can you bring it to church and put it on the middle of the stage and come early? I'm like, okay. So I'm walking in with this giant Buddha, right? <laughs> so I'm walking in, and I walk in the middle of the stage, and I set this big green Buddha down, and I looked at it. And I'm walking away because I volunteered at the coffee shop at the back of the, the room. And I'm walking back to four, I say boys, like ran towards me. One shoved me. And said, what are you doing? And I looked at him and went, I grew up in martial arts. I don't practice anymore because I'm a Christian. But I was like, what's the issue? And they said, you put that blasphemous stuff there? And I'm like, well, first of all, what's blasphemous mean? I'm a new Christian. Like, what are you talking about? They said, anti-God. I'm like, that is, well, that is anti-God. But I, I was told, to, and he goes, and they're getting my face. And they're cornering me. And I'm, I, I was a little, I grew up very short and little. You corner me, I was like a chihuahua. I'll fight you. Right? So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to have blows. And I thought to myself, if, I, if this goes with blows, I'll be arrested and I won't have to speak. I was like, that's a good trade-off. I'm counting the cost. Humiliated in front of a thousand people or arrested in front of eight. 
yeah, let's let's get arrested, right? And I started walking forward, and they said, I said, Scott, Pastor Scott told me to drop this here. Check with him. But if you have an issue, we can take this outside. And then and my friend walked by, my friend Danny Garcia, who walks by, and he goes, black belt, fourth degree. And they, they all turned and looked at him. And they went, are you a black belt? I said, fourth degree. I said, equivalent. I've, I fought a bunch of fourth degree people, and I beat them all. And he, they went, like, we don't want any issues. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, and I walked up and I said, no, no, I don't have an issue with you having an issue. Go check with Scott. If you still have an issue, come get me. I'll, I'll be making frappuccinos. You know, I was the back of the coffee shop. I was, mocha frappuccinos was my station. So I was like, I'll be mixing mocha frappuccinos. And if you don't have an issue, I'll give you one. Like, not a big deal, you know. And then they leave. And I'm sitting there. I'm like sweating bullets. And then all of a sudden, he gets on stage. He's a very dynamic speaker. And he's speaking and speaking. And he goes, I want to introduce. And I'm, I'm walking to the edge of the stage. I was like, because I knew on the spot he could, he could do a whole message. My good friend, Jonathan, I was like, and I wanted to cry, right? And then he says, Jonathan Trong, come on up. And I get up there, hands me the mic, I speak. What you all don't know is for the first, like, gosh, 19 years of my life, I had a severe stutter. And then most of it went away by the time I was saved. And the moment I was saved, my stutter disappeared forever. Well, until I met Olivia and I started some, because I was nervous. But I remember, she, I remember she said that. She was like, I remember you stuttered when you met me. I'm like, yeah, every single time I spoke to you for like two months. Because I didn't want to say the wrong thing, right? So I'm up there speaking. I finish speaking. And then I'm like, thank you. I hand him the mic. There was a standing ovation. And I, and I duck and I ran out behind, behind the, the stage. And I ran up the side wall and I get back at the coffee shop. Because he told me to, to stay off so I can talk to people. And I'm at the coffee shop making frappuccinos. I put my cap on. And all of a sudden, Scott walks up to me and he says, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, he goes, that was really good. And I was like, I'm not feeling very good right now. I feel like throwing up. And then he goes, look at all these people. And there was a line in front of my frappuccino. And I was like, that was the most people I've ever seen ordering fraps. So I was like, I was like, if you haven't ordered yet, go to the cashier and order your fraps. I'm like, there's no way there's 300 people lined up. And he goes, they just want to shake your hand. And I was like, because I've been in deception for 23 years? And he goes, no, because they saw that God is good. And he goes, and then the, the leader of the coffee shop comes over and he goes, come on, I got this. Go. And I walked out there with shaking hands. Y'all know there's, there are Mormons in my salvation story. So I'm walking through. I think about a hundredth person, I walk up and a guy hugs me, like this big guy, big burly dude. And I'm not a very big Asian guy, so he's, he's hugging me. And then he says, uh, I left the Mormon faith three months ago. And I went, oh, okay, that's good. And he goes, he, he's, and he grabs, grabs hold of my whole arm. He's holding on to me. And I'm like, is this going to come to blows again? What is wrong with this church? Like everyone wants to fight me. And he said, Be before I came, yeah, I was on my face crying because I said, I don't think... Christianity is the right way to go. I was about to return to the Mormon church this Sunday and I asked God to give me a sign. And I stopped and I looked at him like a little kid. I was like, I'm that sign. <laughs> and he goes, I know. And I was like, I am that sign because I know. And I hugged him and I was like, bye everybody. The one person supposed to get touched got touched. And I walked, I walked out, out to go eat dinner. <laughs> And, my, and Pat says, Scott was texting me and calling me saying, come back. There's like 200 other people want to shake your hand. I'm like, no. The one guy that needed to hear it was there. I don't know what's wrong with everyone else. And, I, and, and, he, and he says, are you going to continue to share your testimony? I'm like, if, if, if I can encounter that one person each time, I'll do it. And then now, being a pastor, when we travel, we listen to people's testimonies. I'm like amazed. Like you watch Sid Roth. I'm like, whoa. And it's the same similar story. All of us, we were sinners. We were lost. We were blind. We were chasing the wrong thing. God encountered me. Yeah. And I encountered God, and God changed my life. Yeah. Now I don't see my 23 years as failure. It was preparation. Right. right? Here I am, afraid of being kicked out of church. And you know what the enemy did? He sent four, four men, four boys that were like 17 to like 21, to confront me when I, was, when I was there. You know what? One of those guys carried the boot out for me that evening when I was leaving because my mom wanted it back. 
<laughs> but, but all four men came up to me and, and apologized. After where I was done, I was walking out, and they, one bought me dinner that night. I walked out, and he goes, hey, can I buy you dinner? And I was like, dude, don't touch me. And I'm like, y'all really want to get kicked in the face. Like, and he goes, and they both just, all three, all four just lowered their heads and said, we're sorry. We jumped to conclusions. We learned a valuable lesson. And, and he, one guy walked up and grabbed my boot on. I'm like, what are you? And he goes, can I carry this to your car? And I'm like, yeah. Luckily for me, I didn't beat him up. <laughs> right? And God had me be a witness without me wanting to be a witness. What was, what was going to happen was we were going to have witnesses of me beating him up. But God made me a witness to them because I decided to stand firm in what God told me to do through, through this man. I think honor, honor is such a huge thing. Because Scott Crenshaw, he's a pastor out in like, I forgot, Lakeside near Dallas, or Fort Worth area now. He was the authority in my life, and he told me to go in there in peace. Don't worry about what people look at and how people react when I drop the Buddha on the stage. Like, he foresaw that. But I told him like, years later, I was like, did you know four people came up and picked a fight? And he goes, what? He goes, you could have taken them. I went, I know. I, I wanted to. I said, but I didn't want it. I came in the name of God, but also your name, because you invited me to speak. You would have looked really bad to this mega, mega church if, if you're the guest speaker beat up four people, beat up your congregation. Romans 8, 28, Passion Translation. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. And the other translation says, all things work together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. Man, if we as a church and as individuals walk in the design purpose that Christ has called us to, how healthy would this world look? What if we begin to speak what Christ tells us to speak? And then the things that aren't suddenly in the kingdom of God comes alive and gets established here. Our purpose is to be Christ-like in all things. People have asked me earlier on in my walk, they said, which prophet do you model yourself after? And I was like, Jesus. What about apostle? Jesus. Teacher? Jesus. You're a pastor now, right? Who's, who's your, who, who do you want to be like? What, what pastor? And I'm like, Jesus. Evangelist? G Jesus. Why? Because so many people are looking at all these different people. There are many apostles in the, in the, in the Bible, right? But our example is Jesus. We can't, for, we can't afford to look at anyone else. We can't afford to chase after anyone else's identities because our identity is Christ. If we stay Christ, if we, we keep our heart focused on Christ, our eyes on Christ, and our hearts filled with Christ, we can't help but to shine Christ where we go. And then miracles, signs, and wonders will follow. You want the miracles, signs, and the wonders to follow as you follow. You don't want to follow the miracle signs and wonders and chase those without following the one who is the miracle signs and wonders. I promise you that if you're willing to lay down your fears and your fear of failure at God's feet, he will burn it into ashes and in return, paint something beautiful with your life. Every failure is meant to be sacrificed and laid down at Christ's feet, at his altar, so he can burn it and give you beauty for ashes every time. When I look out, man, I see, I don't see any ashes, right? I see beauty. And as God begins to work on your hearts for your life, it's a lifetime. As those fear of failures pop up, there's no evidence that fear of failure is going to happen. Because I failed at something doesn't mean that you'll fail at it. 
or if I perceive, if you perceive that I failed at something, doesn't mean you will if you do the same thing. If Christ called you to do it, there is always beauty to be had. I think it, the humility allows you to see and call forth the flowers to bloom in the deserts. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. So now, beloved ones, stand firm and stable. In other translations, it says, in place of stable, immovable. So now, beloved, stand firm and stable and enduring. Live your lives with unshakable confidence. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. Man, this is the most fruitful church I've ever seen. I'm not just saying that. People online are watching, but I'm not just saying that because this is our church. But I look around like Olivia and I just, we brag to each other about y'all. I'm like, did you hear what Jessica said? Did you watch what Juanita said? Did you hear what Pam said, you know? Did you hear what Susan did, you know? Like all these people, were, like we're bragging about y'all. Like Mia, we brag about Mia a lot. Just, if we boast about you, what do you think God is up there doing right now? God says, Jesus, you, you see her? You see what she did? You see how she responded to that? Did you see her obedience? Watch how, how I work through her now. Man, beauty for ashes. God will paint a beautiful picture with your failures. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you all here. We're going to go out. We're going to do personal and individual, pr- pr- individual prayer. And... Um, Y'all are all invited to participate because it's not about us. It's about God and y'all. Well, we love y'all.